um, I've, I've had that in my experiences, my relationships with you, and uh, I'm sure that's a testimony that others would say, but it's a challenge, isn't it? Uh, that we have a high calling, we as leaders in the church, but you as leaders in the community. And so um, our prayer as the churches is uh, that you continue to be leaders who lead well. We know you have a passion for the, for the city. Uh, we see that in the, the things that happen as part of this city, for the, the, uh, you know, the infrastructure that's in place, for the things that are happening. But uh, our prayer is that you be continue to be leaders of integrity, doing what is helpful for building others up and for building up this city. Uh, that, and that building up is, is about your relationships as well with fellow councillors, with uh, council staff and with the local community. So that's our, our prayer, ongoing prayer for you. And we pray regularly for, for you as uh, councillors and for this city. So let me uh, lead you in prayer. Loving Father, we, we thank you for this uh, beautiful city that we're privileged to call home. We thank you for its natural beauty, but we also thank you for uh, its wonderful infrastructure. We thank you for the freedoms and opportunities we have, and we thank you for this council. Lord, as uh, this team of people gather, we thank you for their commitment and their passion for the city. Father, we pray that you would continue to lead and guide them, that as they work at what is best for the city, that you give them wisdom, that you give them understanding, that you give them uh, a listening ear, that they may continue to hear the needs of the city, work with that and uh, do what is best for all. And as they meet now, they deliberate on important issues. We pray, Father, that you'll give them wisdom. We pray that they'll be able to set aside their personal concerns, that they might work together to serve the common good of Redlands City, the Redlands residents, that they'd honour the purposes for which they've been elected. And so we pray for this agenda before them. Lord, we pray that uh, as they work through it, that uh, they keep in mind the city, the people of this city, and one another. And we just pray that you would bless them, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Uh, Councillors, next item on our agenda is uh, a recognition of achievement. Um, I don't know that I, other councillors have advised me of any, but I certainly have one that's uh, worthy of mention today, if I may. I'd like to acknowledge uh, someone that's been part of this organisation for quite some time, um, probably breaking various records across the way. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly, but I'd like to acknowledge Gary Kelly, who uh, commenced working here um, just probably around the time I finished school. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been very young, Gary. Uh, commenced on the 6th of June 1983 as a junior clerical officer in the rent section. In January 1990, a cleric, he became a clerical and administration officer. It's a long list because he's been here a long time, so bear with me. Um, get out your jaffers. Uh, in 1990, he became the cash management officer. In July 2006, rating services administration team officer. In June 2018, he, that was a, a title change to Billing Support Officer. He's worked both in the rates and water teams and financial operations, trained many, many people over his time here at Council. Um, he's pretty good for a yarn or a story, I'm told. Um, he has many to tell after working here for so long. A few skeletons in the, uh, in the closet there, Gary. Um, believe it or not, he is so revered that he actually has had the same car park for many years most people just knew it was his car park in a public in a public car park. They were too scared to park there in case um, he uh, exerted his authority. Um, sometimes he walks to work. Uh, he's kept an original photo, <laughs> and we've all been guilty of this, Gary. He's kept the original photo on his ID tag until about uh, which, which was taken about 30 years ago. Until about 18 months ago, when he was advised he had to update it, much to his disgust. And I'm sure you look exactly the same as you did 40 years ago. Um, and this is a really interesting element of, um, of Gary's personality. <laughs> Apparently, Gary sneezes, his sneezes are in, allegedly in the Guinness Book of World Records, if they're not, they should be, um, for the loudest sneeze known to mankind. 
Not only have they been known to shake the building, but can rival the loudest sound ever reported, which was the 1883 eruption of Krakatoa. <laughs> I didn't write this, by the way, Gary. <laughs> Just so. There have been reports, when Gary sneezes, of uh, the staff at RPAC actually sending a message saying, bless you. <laughs> Anyway, look, there's no better endorsement of a person's, um, I guess, commitment to this organisation and to the people that run it um, by, by getting an endorsement from one of his peers. And I'd just like to read this from Yolanda Batterby, who was a team leader of building services. So, um, And I su suggest she probably gave me some of the other information, potentially. <laughs> but what she says is, all jokes aside, Gary is not only a valued team member, but also a friend to everyone he comes across. He is loved and respected, a uh, great member of the team and is, uh, and is always the go-to person as a wealth of knowledge or when the history of council is needed. There are not enough words to describe what a wonderful human being he is. As a colleague, Gary is always supportive, especially for new staff during the training phase. He loves, he loves a yarn, loves a joke and is always up for some banter. Gary is passionate about his role in the water team for building services and it shows through his service to customers, both internal and external. Speaking personally, the six and a bit years that I've been with Council and worked with Gary, for most of that time he has given me some of my best memories and best laughs yet. I would love to say we'd love him for another 40 years, but I'm pretty sure neither of us want to still be here in working in 40 years time. So um, councillors, if you could please join me um, in giving a standing ovation to young Gary Kelly. Um, <laughs> and Gary, if you wouldn't mind just coming up, we just have a, a letter of recognition. Um, and I don't know if this really is a it's a token, um, perhaps 40 years is pretty ex extraordinary, so um, we hope you wear this every day, there's a little badge in here. There's not too many 40-year um, recognitions that we do in this organisation. I think as time, as time goes, um, we know with the new generation that probably will be less and less uh, common. So right. congratulations right. again, Gary, and thank you. Councillors, um, item five on the agenda is the receipt and confirmation of minutes. May I, may, have, may I have a mover and seconder, please, that the minutes of the general meeting held on the 17th of May be confirmed. Move Councillor McKenzie, seconder Councillor Hughes. Any items? correctness. There being none, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Next item uh, is just a quick rundown on declaration of prescribed conflicts of interest and declarable conflicts of interest. You're reminded of your responsibilities. 
in relation to a councillor's prescribed conflict of interest and declarable conflict of interest at a meeting. Uh, these responsibilities are also outlined in your agenda. Please be reminded that all interests need to be declared at a statutory meeting of council. This means any prescribed or declarable conflicts of interest relating to an item being discussed at a non-statutory meeting needs to be declared at a general meeting or a special meeting preceding the non-statutory meeting or workshop. The potential list of items to be discussed at all non-statutory meetings are made available to councillors with each workshop agenda before the preceding general meeting so this can be achieved. These declarations can also be made at any time throughout this meeting. I haven't been advised of any councillors, so I'll just move to the matters outstanding and hand over to Louise um, Rassan, Acting CEO, to give us an update. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good morning, councillors and members of the gallery. Uh, there are seven outstanding items from previous general meetings. Two of those are coming off the list for, this uh, for today and are on the general meeting agenda. Item 7.1, the notice of motion for investigation into a lo location for a wildlife hospital. A report will be brought back to a future meeting of council. Item 7.2, the notice of motion relating to the drug and alcohol testing is listed on the agenda for today at item 13.5. Item 7.3, in relation to subordinate local law 4, a report will come to a future meeting of council addressing dot point three of that resolution. Item 7.4, the Local Government Infrastructure Designation Strategy for Birkdale Community Centre, a report will be brought to a future meeting of Council. Item 7.5, the Notice of Motion from Councillor Paul Golay for the Koala Conservation and City Plan is listed on the General Meeting Agenda today at Item 15.3. 7.6, the Notice of Motion from Councillor Wendy Boglari for Heinemann Road Sports Precinct, a report will come to a future General Meeting of Council. And the final item on the list, 7.7, .7, the review of the Shaping South East Queensland Regional Plan 2017 to 2041, a report will be brought to a future meeting of council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sorry, we do have some people that have applied to address council this morning. Um, firstly, if I may, just in accordance with section 6.10 of the council meeting standing orders we allow a period of 15 minutes uh, to be available by resolution to permit members of the public to address the local government on matters of public interest relating to local government. So with that I'll need a, a mover and seconder that uh, the meeting be adjourned for a 15 minute public participation segment to allow members of the public to address council on matters of public interest related to local government. Move councillor Bishop, seconded councillor Golay, those in favour those against that's carried unanimously just before I invite the first speaker up just a little bit of advice as to how we deal with public participation you may have seen some signage um, around chambers this morning regarding pub public participation at meetings it's our usual practice to require any person wishing to address the meeting to state their name the suburb or organization that they represent and the subject that they wish to speak about just a reminder that this information is recorded in the minutes of the meeting, which is a public document available for inspection at Council's Administration Building and published on Council's website. I also just need to remind you that this meeting is being recorded in audio video and that by speaking you acknowledge and agree that the recording video will be placed in the public domain. So any person addressing the meeting will state their name and suburb or the organisation they represent and the subject they wish to speak about. We ask you to stand unless unable to do so act and speak with decorum, be respectful and courteous, make no comments directed at any individual council employee, councillor or member of the public, ensuring that all comments relate to council as a whole. Um, as a chairperson, I have some responsibilities, which is to consider each application on its merits and consider any relevant matter in making my decision to allow or disallow a person to address the local government. Only those members of the public who have an approved application are able to do so. Details on how to apply are on council's website. Also, uh, I have the responsibility of determining the maximum number of speakers based on the persons wanting to speak and the time available. Each speaker has five minutes, dependent on the number of speakers. With, I also uh, have the, the responsibility of withdrawing the approval to address council before the time period has elapsed, elapsed, and just a reminder that debate or discussion cannot be entered into at this point in time. So with that, our first speaker today is uh, Mr. Luigi Deliva, resident of Kipalaba, would you like to come up to the microphone, Mr. Deliva? Over to you. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Luigi Di Leva. I live in 38 Tijuana Drive, Capalaba, and uh, I'm here to talk about um, Greenfield Road and Mud Cotton Green Acre Caravan Park. Uh, that the work is being carried there. Um, my concern is why, after 20 years, that this caravan park has been knocked back uh, permission to do the work and extension. Now I believe that uh, the council gave permission to do some work and import fuel of 7,700 cubic meters of soil. Now there is an excess of 50,000 cubic meters of soil. Um, they're supposed to, the height of the soil is supposed to be 1.8 meters, and now it's at the reach of 4 meters high behind our properties. I invited a few of the um, inspectors from my property to see the, the work that they're carrying on. Um, unfortunately, only one person came, and uh, she was not impressed of what she saw and what's going on. One of your um, inspector finally got on the jaw on the caravan park and the people from the caravan park kicked him out from the property saying you're not allowed to be here, you're not allowed to check my work, you're not you're not welcome here. So he kicked him out from the property. Now my problem is I am at the back of this property uh, number 38 I said I got an easement behind my property I've been flooded already twice from the water that come from these properties now my concern is they put so much soil there they changed the water downstream into the easement um, the easement is too small uh, the easement is too small 80 by 80 cannot collect the amount of water coming from there. Also, um, there is a green, uh, gray water discharging into the pit every day, every minute of the day, coming from the caravan park, discharging into downstream into the creek. I send a lot of information to the council, to all the inspectors here. They got thousands of video of work and everything else now um, also there is no erosion control right? uh, finally they put some erosion control net all they did is put few sticks went with the stapler pop 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 and that's the erosion control this soil now is about eight meters from my property and I got a wall about four meters high of soil no retaining wall no drainage no anything okay um, first of all you know uh, why the council consider to give permission to do any work at all in a residential area uh, the traffic on um, Greenfield Road is very bad to get in and out in the morning from Mount Cotton Road. Also, I advise the council that the caravan park has not, does not have enough parking spaces into the caravan park because they, uh, they want an extension to put some more 10 caravan on there or 10 new homes or whatever they want to do. Um, Imagine that at night time, there is 10 cars every day parked in front of the caravan park, which makes really bad going out on Mott Canton Road, because they got no parking. Now, if you want 10 more homes or 10 more caravan, you need car park. You need enough space to accommodate that. They haven't got it. They park in front of the properties every night and every morning. You can go there now and they will be parked there. Um, 
It, the, the, um, the work that they are doing now has been not controlled. They do have an engineer that they start to work. They start to work. They do have an engineer. But who does the work? Two people that they don't know anything. One drives the bobcat, one drives the little bulldozer. They are doing everything. The, the engineer is gone. I've never seen anybody up there from the beginning. They did a little bit of work, they're gone, and they carry on with what they want to do. Mr. Deliver, we're, we're at five minutes, so if you don't, over here. <laughs> you, uh, we're at five minutes, so if you don't mind wrapping up, and um, yes. that would be okay. great. Okay, finally, uh, uh, finally, I just want to say that uh, this, what's going on there is illegal, dangerous to property and to uh, people too because it can happen that at night time big rain come can wash everything down. They need retaining wall, they need a, another easement in their property and the, the job is not done. They need people to go and have a look and what they're doing because all the work they're doing it's everything in the go. That's all I want to say. Um, thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. Deliver. And yeah. I understand there's a petition being presented uh, later in the agenda. And also, we have had development control officers listening to you presenting to council. Um, and I understand there has been there is there has been some processes going on behind the scenes, and an application has been lodged. Um, and officers are dealing with it, but um, I, I'm sure that the petition will also help deal with that. So we thank you um, for your time this morning. Right, thank thank you. you. Our next speaker is uh, Nigel Kruger, who's a resident of Sheldon. Come on, Nigel, uh, come on down. Just start with your, your name, suburb, organisation uh, you might represent, and also um, the subject you wish to speak about. No problems. Uh, good morning, Madam Mayor. Uh, councillors and other attendees. My name is Nigel Kruger and I represent the Mount Cotton Riders Alliance, addressing the issue of trail maintenance within the Eastern Escarpment Conservation Area. Uh, as a bit of background, the Mount Cotton Riders Alliance was formed in June of last year by members of the mountain biking community following continued concerns due to lack of trail maintenance and engagement by the Redland City Council. And since this time, the club has gained its status as an incorporated association, affiliation with the peak national body of cycling, and has grown to over 70 members. Since the construction of the trails in the Eastern Escarpment, the community has attempted to engage with council in order to establish a trail maintenance program, commonly referred to as trail care, manned by volunteers and resourced through community organisations. The first of these attempts was through the Rat Cycling Club and I'd like to acknowledge their committee's efforts in attempting to establish trail care for the Eastern Escarpment. The second attempt was a joint application with the Mount Cotton Riders Alliance and the Rat Cycling Club in late 2022. This attempt was denied due to no resources available on the part of council with further investigation determining that both liability and the model of trail care also being areas of council concern. Contrary to the fact that trail care programs are established and operating in the Bayview Conservation Area and the Scribbly Guns Conservation Areas. Regarding liability, I'd liken it to any form of infrastructure constructed for public use. If the council were to construct a bicycle pathway without a maintenance regime resulting in degradation of the pathway, then the Redland City Council would likely be liable for any public injury as a result. Of course, maintenance comes at a cost to the Council in both human and physical resources. Currently, maintenance is being conducted by private contractors on an ad hoc basis and what can only be assumed at considerable cost to the Redland City Council. Volunteer-led trail care teams have demonstrated the ability to contribute to the longevity of the trail networks and provide economic benefit, as provided in Oz Cycling's commissioned report on mountain biking in Australia, which demonstrated an annual benefit of over $3,000 per volunteer. Such programs as the Logan Community Trail Care Alliance and the Northside Trail Care Alliance are just two local examples whereby community-driven trail care is conducted by volunteers and in collaboration with landowners. 
The Mount Cotton Riders Alliance recently applied for landowners' consent to establish a trail maintenance program for the Eastern Escarpment Conservation Area. The proposal is based on an established model in which risk mitigation based approach implements three levels of trail care. It will utilise Auscycling's recently released Australian Mountain Biking Trail Guidelines as the governing standard and will prevent any modification to the existing trail design, footprint or features and therefore not increasing the current level of difficulty and as a result does not increase the, li li the risk of liability to the council. This method will not impact the surrounding environment and mitigates the risk of trail degradation which can result in personal injury. It proposes a collaborative approach with the Redland City Council and can be fully resourced through community and private enterprise donations, therefore deferring capital expenditure in engaging private contractors. Finally, I'd like to highlight the important asset this trail network presents. Via the recent Fox Superboa event, through which we achieved a Queensland record of over 400 participants across two days, with a further 332 participants in the following schools event, providing an economic benefit of over $300,000 to the Redlands area. The trail network is used by as a training ground for trail runners, mountain bikers and adaptive mountain bikers alike and is frequented by international competitors of our sport. Alongside its presence as an environmentally important area for conservationists, horse riders, walkers and families to enjoy, the Eastern Escarpment is the jewel in the crown for the Redland City Council and I ask the Council to consider a constructive, meaningful and positive engagement with the mountain biking community in order to maintain this pristine network in an environmentally sustainable way, excuse me, for the betterment of the entire Redlands community. Thank you. Thank you, Nadu. Well done. Cheers. Our next speaker is Mr. Timothy Gatt. <coughs> Timothy, if you just come up to the microphone, um, I think you know the drill name, suburb, organisation you represent and the subject you wish to speak about. Over to you. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Tim Degat. I live in uh, Victoria Point uh, on Sycamore Parade behind the uh, shopping centre. Um, just talking about the, the Tea Clan gate, I use that gate twice a night. Um, it's gotten a lot of bad publicity lately but um, the, I petitioned the, uh, the local area and spoke to people and everyone uses that gate. We go to the shops, we go to the medical centre, Bunnings, um, it was getting shut at 10 o'clock. The trial period was much earlier. Um, but I personally get home from work about 6.30 at night. I go through it with my dog. I come home, I go back to Woolies at 9. Um, just, it, it's getting a lot of bad publicity lately and at Kate, it's very helpful for everyone in the community. Um, yeah, that's about all I have to say really. Sorry, I'm not very good at this. Been great, Timothy, and yeah. we, we also recognise there's a petition that's being lodged as well today. Yes, along with one of the bigger things with that is I walked around the community and like 113 signatures doesn't sound like a lot, but it was almost unanimous in the fact that people wanted to vote. There was very few, there was a couple of people that didn't want to sign because they didn't care about the gate, and there was um, there was one that wanted it shut, but the overall view of the community was that they wanted the gate open. Um, yeah, it, it's good access to all the shops and stuff, and even though the tavern maybe has a bad rap, it is one of the local businesses, it's, it's legal, it's allowed to be there, and I walk back from the tavern through the gate after 9 o'clock, after 10 o'clock, and yeah, it's good lit access, this pathway for, um, for the community. That's all. Thank you. Timothy, thank you, and uh, thanks to all the speakers this morning who, who all have um, associated petitions, so um, well done to all of you. So I think that's all we have, councillors, so I need a a motion, a mover and seconder that we resume our meeting proceedings. Move Councillor Edwards, seconded Councillor Golay. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Next item uh, will be petitions and presentations. And so with that, uh, we do have a number of petitions to be presented. We've heard from some of those petitioners this morning. Um, I might start with Councillor Boglari, however, to uh, present her petition. Uh, thank you. 
Today I have a petition from residents requesting that Council install traffic calming devices in Frederick Street, Wellington Point. The petition states, we, the undersigned, request that Council support the urgent request for traffic calming devices to be constructed in our street to combat the frequent and dangerously in incidences of speeding and hooting, hooning in our residential street. I move the motion that the petition is of an operational nature and be received and referred to the Chief Executive Officer for consideration. So moved, seconded by Councillor Bishop. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Councillor Hewlett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have a petition from residents requesting that Council reinstate the lock gate time frame to the gate between Home Co and Sycamore Parade, Teak Lane, Victoria Point. We, the undesigned... Did I get a seconder for that? Sorry, I need oh, a... Oh, sorry, no, I, yeah, sorry, do you want, do you want to just sorry, read the motion? My apologies. Was that it? Yeah, the petition says, We, the undersigned, petition council to reinstate the 10pm to 6am lock time frame to the gate between Home Co Victoria Point, Queensland 4165 and Sycamore Parade, Teak Lane. I move the motion that this is of, a <coughs> excuse me, of an operational nature and be received and referred to the Chief Executive Officer for consideration. Move Councillor Hewlett, seconded Councillor Golay. Those in favour? Those against? It's carried unanimously. You have another one, Councillor Hewlett? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a petition from residents requesting that Council remove the lock gate between Home Co and Sycamore Parade, Teak Lane, Victoria Point, stating that we, the undersigned, undersigned, petition Council to remove the lock gate between Home Co, Victoria Point, Queensland 4165 and Sycamore Parade, Teak Lane. Um, I move the motion that this is of operational nature and be received and referred to the Chief Executive Officer for consideration. So moved. A seconder for that, thanks. Seconded Councillor Edwards. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Councillor Berridge. Uh, thank you. Item 10.4. I too have a petition from residents requesting that Council investigate development control at Greenacres Caravan Park, Calabar. Can I have a seconder for that motion? Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, Sec sorry, is that <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll ask for a second. It's oh. okay. You, you, you're the mover. I'm so moved. You move the motion. Seconded, Councillor Hughes. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Councillor Golo? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I have a petition from residents requesting that Council reverse the decision to no longer require the road connection between Connie Way and Cle Cleveland Redland Bay Road, Thornlands and it's part of uh, an application, MCU 22 slash 0167. Uh, it says, we, the undersigned, uh, request that Council reverse the decision from the 1st of February 2023 to no longer require the road connection between Connie Way and Cleveland Redland Bay Road. This is located opposite Waterline Boulevard and is part of a development application by Thompson of Price Limited on MCU 22 slash 0167 and that the, the enforcement, the, the enforcer requirement of this road connection consistent with the Southeast Thornland structure plan and the expectations <coughs> of existing residents. We make this appeal based on the traffic impact forecast of this new development, indicating a 48.8% increase to traffic using Harrington Boulevard during peak times. I move that this motion is of an operational nature and be received and referred to the Chief Executive Officer for consideration. Move Councillor Golay, second to Councillor Bishop. Those in favour? Those against? That's uh, carried unanimously. Councillor Berridge, I'm going to need to ask you to go back to your petition and read the motion. Sorry, we, I got sort of um, yes, sidetracked when you asked for a seconder. Over so, to you, sorry. Councillor Berridge. Just to make sure we, and I, I could just take the indulgence of the second to Councillor Hughes, I think. So just let, if I allow that to be read out in public, thank you. Do you want me to start from the beginning again? Just, uh, just uh, to read out the motion, Councillor. Okay. Um, the motion, the, the points are, it's illegal work changing the course of the water down the easement. Uh, number two, excess soil from 7,700 cubic metres to 4,000 cubic metres. Height of the soil that should be 1.8 is now 4 metres in height. Flooding into neighbouring property and washing soil into the creek. Illegal discharge of grey water into easement. Greenfield Road traffic, easement to small 
to collect water. Uh, I move that the petition, which is of an operational nature, be received and referred to the Chief Executive Officer for consideration. Thank you, Councillor Berridge, and apologies that I jumped the gun as well. Um, and and Councillor Hughes just just accepting that as a seconder, and I'll just get Councillor to councillors to once again support that. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. I apologise that I jumped the gun too. Uh, Councillor Hewlett, you now have also another petition. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have a petition from residents requesting that Council allocate a restriction-free dog beach at Coochie Mudlow Island. The petition states that we, the undersigned, respectfully request as ratepayers and residents of Coochie Mudlow Island, Council allocate us a restriction-free beach to be used any time from dawn to dusk to exercise and swim with our dogs whenever we see fit. We request this as we feel the health and well-being of our residents and dog-loving visitors to the island is being neglected. To us, our dogs are family members and should be included in our recreational exercise on our beaches with us at any time. We would advocate relocating the dog beach from the front beach west of the barge ramp to Norfolk Beach on the eastern end of the island. Th thank you. I move that this petition is of operational nature and be received and referred to the Chief Executive Officer for consideration. So moved by Councillor Hewlett, seconder. Councillor Edwards, those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Um, councillors, and we do now have some presentations um, from councillors who have attended various conferences and the like. Um, we'll start with Councillor Tolte, if I may, um, who is reporting on um, two items. Over to you. No, my, my. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I might ask your indulgence for the presentation on Taiwan Smart Cities uh, because it's a little long. I did go through and uh, look at what I could delete, but there are so many important points. I really feel the need to put it all on record. And there's a little gift for each of you. There's a little pineapple cake in your seat. Pineapple cake's the very... N yeah, well-known traditional um, cake of Taiwan. So I hope you enjoy that with a cup of coffee today. I don't think it meets the threshold, Councillor. Uh, and it comes from me. Uh, I'm very pleased to share my recent experience at the Smart Cities uh, Summit and Expo in Taiwan. The Smart Cities Summit and Expo was an event that brings together leaders, innovators and experts in the field of smart cities. It serves as a platform for showcasing, ex showcasing and exploring cutting edge technologies, strategies and solutions aimed at creating sustainable, efficient and livable urban environments. The summit focuses on the concept of smart cities, which involves leveraging technology, data and innovative approaches to enhance various aspects of urban life, including transportation, energy, infrastructure, governance and public services. It addresses challenges faced by cities worldwide, such as population growth, resource management, environmental impact and the need for improved quality of life. At the Smart City Summit, and Expo, government officials, industry leaders, researchers and professionals gather to share their experiences, <coughs> exchange ideas and collaborate on solutions for building smarter cities. And there were delegates at the summit from all over the world, uh, including um, countries currently in, in war in um, Europe. So it was important enough for them, they felt, to still come. The event includes keynote speakers, uh, panel discussions, workshops, exhibitions and networking opportunities, providing a platform for knowledge sharing, showcasing best practices and fostering collaboration among stakeholders. The summit also serves as a venue for exploring business opportunities related to smart city development. It brings together investors, entrepreneurs and startups to showcase innovative products, services and technologies that can contribute to the advancement of smart cities. The event was co-hosted by the city governments of Taipei and Kaohsiung, Taiwan's largest and second largest cities. As the representative of Redland City Council, I had the privilege of attending this prestigious event alongside global leaders in government and business. Accompanying me were Council's Group Manager for Economic Development and Investment and the Service Manager for Strategic Partnerships. And while the two persons are not named in the report. I really would like to um, uh, 
recommend to all the councillors that you understand their roles and what they do because they're incredibly good at their jobs and that they are a great advantage to uh, this organisation. A key part of the agenda was the City Leaders Summit. This serves as a high level platform for mayors and city leaders worldwide to exchange ideas and visions on smart city governance and development. It allows participants to outline the future of their cities based on their unique characteristics, location and culture. As one of the major highlights of the event, the summit has become one of the world's largest networking platforms among city governments gathering representatives from over 100 cities from around the globe. This year, the summit sought to understand how the concepts of net zero and smart cities are being brought together to create sustainable and resilient urban environments. The summit particularly focused on transportation and buildings, which are significant sources of greenhouse gas emissions. I was pleased to have the opportunity to present at the City Leaders Summit on the work being done in Redland City to reduce carbon emissions from our public transport services, as well as the important role our city has played in developing the green hydrogen industry in Queensland. Kim Kerwin, Redland City Council's Group Manager for Economic Development and Investment, also had the opportunity to present during the summit. Kim highlighted, highlighted Council's plans for the Birkdale Community Precinct and the incorporation of smart technology into the site's design. The Smart Cities Summit and Expo not only gave us access to some of the world's leaders in smart city thinking, but also provided us an excellent opportunity to deepen the economic con connection between Redland City and Taiwan. To help take advantage of these opportunities and to ensure maximum value for the trip, Trade and Investment Queensland arranged a number of meetings and events with key stakeholders and potential investors for ourselves and other Queensland mayoral delegations, including Bundaberg, Scenic Rim and Gladstone. The events included morning tea with the Australian representative to Taiwan and I'm pleased to say a lunch with our very own Lynn family at who, as you know, are residents of Redland City and prominent investors here. We also included discussions with senior executives and board members of some of Taiwan's largest companies, including Brogent Technologies, which is the company that makes the technology I've spoken of previously that I would love to see incorporated into Birkdale, uh, and an advanced technology manufacturer in the entertainment industry, China Petroleum, the sole Taiwanese state-owned energy company, and Hunan Bank, one of the major financial institutions in Taiwan. These meetings provided the mayors and I the opportunity to pitch investment opportunities specific to our cities and showcase our unique opportunities. One particular highlight of the trip was a dinner function hosted by Trade and Investment Queensland. The dinner hosted more than 50 successful global talent visa holders uh, for a program that offers migration pathways to Australia for high wealth and exceptionally talented individuals fostering skills transfer, promoting innovation and creating employment opportunities. This dinner was an opportunity for Redland City and other councillors, uh, councils to pitch their city to these exceptional individuals. The competition was fierce with strong cases from all local governments being made. But when it came to our chance to pitch our city, the Lynn family gave us a competitive edge. Jo Lynn of Raby Bay Harbour kindly attended the dinner to support our delegation he provided valuable insight for the dinner attendees and was very well received with a number of attendees going out of their way to meet him. Miss Phyllis Lowe, Joe's mother and director of his family company also help, gave us a helping hand by recording a video testimonial which we played as part of our presentation that evening. The video was highly impactful giving both a strong professional and personal account as to why she and her husband Lingo Lin chose Redland City as their place to live and invest and why others should do the same. I'm very grateful to both Phyllis and Joe for taking the time to be part of the pitch, which I'm thrilled to say was a great success and has had many follow-ups from the attendees about coming to Redland City. Since the Queensland Dinner Council's Economic Development and Investment Team have been working with four visa holders who are actively exploring investment opportunities in Redland City as a result of Two of them have already committed and have started the process of relocating while the other two potential investors are investigating the opportunities. The two confirmed investors are senior leaders in a technology business that is wholly owned by the world's largest technology manufacturer, 
Foxconn, makers of iPhones, Xboxes, Playstations and more. They alone are projected to bring over $5 million to Redland City economy in the short term, the, with the potential for a significant growth in the future as their Australian operation expands. Of the other investors who are actively investigating, Redland City is a place to do business. One is a leader in Taiwan's tourist accommodation industry, while the other is a manufacturer of biodegradable plastics products. These are the kinds of smart and clean industries Redland wants and needs, and so I am delighted that the Council has played a role in attracting them to our local economy. In addition to the financial benefits, these exceptional people will also help enrich the cultural fabric of our city and build our small but highly valued Taiwanese community. It is indeed a testament to our city's appeal that we attract such high quality residents and investors. So why is it important to build positive relationships between the Taiwanese business community and Redland City? The answer is that Taiwan is an important trading partner for Queensland and Queensland City and, and Redland City finds itself in a uniquely favourable position to attract investment from this important market which specialises in the kinds of clean, smart industries that we want to attract here. In terms of market <coughs> excuse me, importance, Taiwan stands as Queensland's fifth largest export market and seventh largest trading partner. Its unique relationship with China and central location within Asian supply chains make it a crucial market for Queensland businesses. The presence of five Taiwanese banking institutions with branch offices in Queensland demonstrates the significant investment and economic benefits derived from this partnership. In fact, we anticipate the opening of a sixth Taiwanese bank in Queensland, further bolstering funds, employment and economic growth for our state. With respect to opportunities, the Taiwan government launched the new, South, the new southbound policy in 2016 aiming to drive economic development and regional integration between ASEAN, South Asia, New Zealand and Australia. This policy covers key aspects such as economic and trade relations, science, technology, culture, resources sharing, talent exchange and new cooperation to foster a sense of economic community. Moreover, Taiwan's 5 plus 2 innovative industry plan supports seven industries and projects driving Taiwan's industrial growth and sustainable development. These industries range from intelligent machinery and green energy to biomedicine, national defence and aerospace, new agriculture and the circular economy. Redland City as a South East Queensland Council is well placed to attract investment from these industries and others. Our region is home to Australia's largest Taiwanese community and our city has a number of prominent connections with Taiwan, including the Council's partnership with Taiwanese multinational Shea Group to develop the Kapalabar Town Centre. Thanks to the Smart Cities Conference and Expo, Redland City Council has had the opportunity to establish connections in Taiwan over several years. Existing connections are influential factors for Taiwanese businesses when making decisions on where to invest and so Redland City starts ahead of the field in many ways. Another important factor for us is our schools. Redland City's elite schools and the quality of the education they provide are internationally recognised and are highly valued opportunities for the children of Taiwanese families looking to invest in Australia. Education is of utmost importance to many Taiwanese families, so when looking to invest abroad, the quality of the schools is very significant in their consideration. It is fair to say that the Smart City Summit and Expo has, over several years, presented an excellent opportunity for Redland City. Delegation accommodation and in-country transport are provided by the Smart City Summit and Expo. In addition, the Council has the cost of airfares for the delegation lead, in this case myself, fully reimbursed, meaning the costs of attendance to the, for the Council are minimum. Redland City stands ready to capture the opportunities created so far and build on them, while forging stronger ties with Taiwan and building a prosperous future for both regions. Oh, sorry. Sorry? Oh, I would like to just highly uh, recommend to councillors, if you have the opportunity, to meet um, our Queensland delegate in um, Taiwan when he is here. Um, 
the quality of the meetings that we had the opportunity to take were exceptional. And when I spoke with delegates from other states of Australia who were at the conference, the meetings that they had were not of the same calibre as ours, and that was purely down to the fact that we have a, Queen, a, a special Queensland Trade Commissioner, and he's exceptionally good at his job. And I can't recommend enough uh, the work of our staff in economic development in this and other areas. They are exceptional. So thank you, councillors. And Madam Mayor, if I could, the next presentation perhaps Councillor Hughes could go and then I could follow. No problems, yes, and uh, Patrick Appenstein um, is definitely a very um, important asset for our state. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know, he was he was on that train uh, in Taiwan and we nearly lost him. So um, it's great that he's come back in full force and supporting Queenslanders um, and investment from Taiwan back here. Okay, Councillor Hughes, um, hard act to follow, but we'll start with you on the Algua conference. Uh, th thank you Mayor and Councillors. Indeed a hard act to follow. Thank you Councillor Tolte. I'm talking about the Australian Local Government Women's Association, which is, uh, as the Mayor has just said, ALGWA, WA, the 2023 National Conference that was held the 17th to the 20th of May last month. This year's conference theme of connect, inspire and thrive was immediately met with the inspiring side of the conference being held at the RACV's Cape Shank on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria's resort is the only word I can put it. Uh, it's a golf course for anyone that likes to uh, hit a ball around but the, um, the actual building was so impressive. Councillor Tolte and I were connected with over a hundred delegates from across Australia that took the time to support and share their stories with each other over the three days of the conference. And I thank Council for the opportunity to attend this fabulous annual conference yet again this year. Guest speakers were led by the gorgeous MC that they had organised this year, Tasneem Chopra OAM, cross-cultural consultant and broadcaster. She's just beautiful if anyone's had the opportunity to be in the room with her. Uh, the guest list is, is long and they've all got impressive titles, but the, the words have been sent through for our minutes. The Honourable Julie Bishop, Athena Ali, Stacey Daniel, Margot Foster, Catherine Fox, Michael Stefanovic, Ulrich Frederick, Melanie Jones, the Honourable Melissa Horn, Rosie King, Kath Koschel, Rebecca McKenzie, Christy McBain, MP, Marie McPherson, Robert Musgrove, Renee Rainbow, Katie Rowe, Mina Singh, Lena Thompson, Ashley Vanderberg, but stopping at Simon Kushmashner, I'm sure I didn't pronounce it right, and Simon was the founder and director of Demographics Group Simon had the room enthralled with boring numbers, honestly boring numbers, but telling amazing stories of what the numbers really mean, what the impact really means when we look at our demographics, what the facts really are, and bringing the house down with his recommendation that planning be taken away from local government. <coughs> and put into the hands of the state government. You could only imagine the room. Many agreeing, but many more disagreeing. The room was in uproar, and Councillor told he was in great, indeed thriving on the topic. I didn't read out the titles for all of those uh, names that I've just read, but they will be in the minutes. But what I wanted to say was behind these names were real people. They shared their amazing stories, their experiences, their advice, their learning, the bigger picture, governance, discussions, thoughts and histories of lessons learnt. We should never forget some of those histories. Um, points won and lost, sad and funny moments, our biases, which is always important, both real and perceived, which is, it's, it's important, but it's pretty confronting when you think about some of our biases, self-included. For me, the standout was Melanie Jones, OAM. Mel's reference to her fellow, so she's our uh, lady cricketer, 
and her reference to her fellow male cricketers in their design and implementation of the groin guard or the groin shield or perhaps the groin protector was in the 1920s. And she did point out that the design and implementation of the cricket helmet for the head nearly a hundred years later <laughs> truly caused the biggest belly laugh of the conference. Like we've got to get our priorities right. In council was, <clears throat> if, our, if our council was ever looking for a most inspiring local government speaker, please consider Lena Thompson. She should be at the top of everyone's list. She's an amazing, being a former CEO of local government, a councillor and a mayor, and she's currently the president of local government professional group, LG Pro. Her journey and insights are beyond valuable. She's truly connected, inspiring, and thriving woman of gentleness with a love of local government. What this lady doesn't know isn't worth knowing, but as a guest speaker and for our staff and our community, she's fantastic. Truly recommend her. Thank you. And Councillor Tolte, um, Julie Bishop, Count, uh, the Honourable Julie Bishop, and of course your, um, your numbers and facts. That was the highlights for you, I'm sure. Councillor Tolte, did you want to um, add to that? I will very quickly add to that. Um, as we know, Councillor Hughes always writes a better report on conferences than I do. Uh, but I would like to add, as, as was mentioned, that the themes of the conference were advocacy, leadership, capability and sustainability. And the connection uh, and connection. And these were the topics covered across all of those dynamic speakers and presentations that were mentioned in Councillor Hughes's report at the 2023 Women in Local Government Conference. Um, it was a very worthwhile few days, not the least of which was the opportunity to see how other government areas um, work to promote their regions and their unique uh, qualities and produce. And they're doing it very well on the peninsula in Victoria. And it was quite impressive to see the um, very m small micro businesses um, that were getting an opportunity to have a presence through uh, a collective um, council-led tourism opportunity. Um, there were, as Councillor Hughes said, uh, so many uh, accomplished women there, um, but I'll just note a couple, and as, as was noted, one of the, the, the keynote speaker at the top of the list, and to a very full house uh, on, the, on the Monday, I think it was for her presentation, um, was the Honourable Julie Bishop and she's currently the Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University and former Minister for Foreign Affairs. And she spoke on the challenges for women in male-dominated roles across decades of, of working to, toward that, that goal of becoming a foreign minister and, and the work that she does now in universities. Um, we heard some fascinating stories about learning to strategize in order to gain attention um, from the world's media as she worked through those roles and, and to make sure that she was getting an opportunity to benefit Australia when dealing with world leaders and characters such as Boris Johnson, who tended to dominate and uh, prevent her message getting through. And she talked about the different ways that she found to um, get the media uh, to, to present the information that she needed to get out in her role. So it was really interesting. Um, as also already mentioned, Taz, Tazni, Tazim Chopra, OAM, was the MC across the conference. And she's an incredibly accomplished and highly educated woman. And just spending time with her over those few days was very inspirational. She was awesome. Um, for me, the most lasting impression uh, from these many speakers was made by Kath Koschel. She's a young woman who presents on her mission and organisation, the kind, Kindness Factory. Uh, if you're not aware, please take the time to look her up. It's really worth your time. She's true, she truly has a tragic but inspiring story. And I've got a little just outtake here to explain who Kath is. Kath was a young woman who was an international uh, national cricketer for this, the women's uh, New South Wales team 
she uh, broke her spine um, training um, for an Ironman competition and when she was learning to walk again um, she met her partner she taught herself to walk again physically and through a period of approximately 10 years she actually broke her spine twice uh, and she met her partner who had also was also in the spinal unit and she finally came out the other side only to lose him to suicide so it was uh, just a, an incredible amount for one person to deal with and the fact that she's come out and she's become an, an, a worldwide influence on growing kindness <coughs> is is something quite amazing and the other person that was really uh, something to behold as mentioned by Council Hughes and I won't pronounce it correctly either is Simon Kuschenmacher who is a specialist in statistics but Simon is just a, a quirky, uh, funny, uh, very good speaker. And he takes uh, the information, he has a group called Demographics Group, and I would encourage anyone to Google him. And, and he has a social media platform where he puts out inspirational um, information based on what would otherwise be very dry, boring data. Um, he is amazing and uh, it's worth your time to have a look at the information that he presented. Standing in a room full of council people and telling them that they should lose the opportunity to uh, manage planning was, was a brave thing to do and, uh, and his presentation was very worthwhile. So it was a worthwhile uh, conference and it was a privilege to be there, so thank you. Thanks, councillors. And, and for next meeting, you get to look forward to another presentation on the ALGA conference, uh, Congress, but not for today. <laughs> so you can all breathe easy. Uh, so we'll now go into um, the agenda. Is there any motion to alter the order of business? Uh, there being none, um, our first report is 13.1. Could I have a mover, please, for the May 2023 monthly finance report? Move, Councillor Edwards, second to Councillor McKenzie. Would you like to speak to it, um, Councillor Edwards? Just briefly, Madam Mayor. Um, just to note that this is the uh, second last monthly report for the end of the financial year. Um, and I, I reflect on the executive summary of this, which points that um, Council reported year to date operating surplus of 33.95 million and there's a number of issues if you read there that's contributed to that and uh, also the council's capital works expenditure was below budget by 39.62 million dollars again due to a number of issues infrastructure supply chain issues there's a whole raft of things so whilst our figures are good and council's a sound position it was me to reflect that next week we bring out budget for the following year this has the challenges that it faces all councils. Uh, we're going moving forward. It's very difficult from a budget to know exactly what's coming up. We're still faced with uh, high interest rates, inflations, pressures, the uh, supply chains, um, builders, etc. Right across the board, things are moving. So uh, I think we've done uh, for this point really well and continue to do so for the utmost confidence and losses. But there is just makes me reflect that there are real difficulties for councils in this present environment in uh, moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Any speakers against? You, you advised a question. Thanks, Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Mayor. And following on from Councillor Edwards, his summary, m my question through you to our CFO. I I'm looking at page 5 of 14 or page 36 of the agenda when we're looking at our materials and services analysis and we've got there about uh, 6.8 million underspend and we're in, in the, the month of May, not June, even though we're in the June meeting as Councillor Edwards has just said. And then when you flick across the pages again with the City Water and Capital Funding Statement on page 12 of 14 and we talk about capitalised expenditure and again an underspend there of 9 million. We've got We've got challenges. We, we really understand that, CFO. But these underspends, they're, they're significant numbers. As we go into budget week next week, I'm genuinely concerned about these specifics. But our city water, nine, nine million underspend. 
to date. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you, thank you, Councillor Hughes, for the opportunity, and also thank you, Councillor Edwards, for um, the acknowledgement of the challenges that um, not only Redland City Council faces, but the broader industry, um, and, in, and in fact, the world. Um, so, Councillor Hughes, to start off with your comment on the City Water um, Capital Funding Statement on page 12 of 14, um, you're absolutely correct. So, the Capital Delivery Programme is behind, um, as at the end of May, um, in the order of $9 million, mainly in part to um, over $4 million of sewage pump stations. And I'm sure we know the technical challenges with those, but not only the, the programme of works that we've currently got, um, and my colleagues have shared with me is um, switchboard renewals, switchboard maintenance, um, wet well renewals, um, a lot of things that I don't quite understand, but certainly we've got challenges in both the inventory, um, getting the raw materials, but then also the, the tender, and I think it was the switchboard um, Nicole shared with me as my peer that um, we had a contractor pull out. The second contractor who was in that tender process, um, we didn't think that was value for money for the community. So as custodians of public money, um, we're not willing to compromise and we're going to go out to tender again. So that's um, over $4 million in those sewage pump stations. There's, um, again, thanks to Nicole and her team, over a million dollars in water main replacements that's behind. Um, we have a contractor. It's a two-part um, program in the same um, um, area. So they're finishing off um, the first part and then going on to the second part. So we're, we're pretty optimistic that the works are progressing um, to the best of our ability and as we always know the accounting treatment doesn't respect um, the challenges and at 30 June midnight we'll close the books but of course the work continues so um, all the officers behind the scenes and behind these executives are feverishly working away to, to close out what we can so in the city water space um, lots of work with complexities um, I don't think we will come in um, having closed it all out at 30 June um, but that's not unusual because of the complexity of work and we will just continue the work until it's done. But we've always got um, your um, principles in um, the policy positions that we don't compromise on um, value for money. So um, we've gone back out to 10 one, one aspect in particular. So that's City Water and I just want to reassure you, Councillor Hughes, um, if the money isn't spent, it's kept in the bank. So um, the, these executives and myself, we don't have any authority to spend it on something else. So then when the works do get done, we'll use that money so we don't levy again um, for the same works. And I think Councillor Edwards probably talked to the other comment you made about materials and services. Um, so in the city water space, it's capital. On the other page, I think it was page five of 14, you referenced Councillor Hughes. Um, materials and services, again, very challenging. Um, we buy raw materials, we buy bulk water, as you know, um, and then it's a pass through. And we have contractors and consultants where we can source those stakeholders we can and if we can't we try and put contingencies or or delay the work so um, we are um, as always working hard to, to deliver the program um, with what we have available to us um, councillor edwards talked to the operating surplus and the monies we know that we levied the rates and charges in april we won't levy again before the end of the year so that money um, that was levied in april due in may um, needs to last right through to midnight on 30 June. So that's why there's a large figure in there, relatively speaking. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you. You have a question, Councillor Bishop? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, CFO, and also to councillors for those questions. I think it's, it's really important. Um, one thing I'd like to ask is, as we look to our budgeted expectations, and then when we do our actuals for the year, is there a metric that might help us in future keep our eye on where there are discrepancies, because I understand we're in a volatile and changing environment and there's been many things over the last few years that have come as a surprise to us. But as we move into multi-year programs, could we look at something that reconciles what we intended to do and demonstrates where we ended up that gives us greater understanding so that we can understand the difference between market fluctuations and things that we could do better to make sure that we are looking at projects as we go. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you as the Chair. Thank you, Council Bishop, for the opportunity to talk to that. Um, a couple of things spring to mind straight away. So we absolutely do, um, not so much a reconciliation, but there's something called backcasting. So when we do plan our future works, there are a lot of assumptions and parameters that we put into our models, whether they're financial models or capital planning models. 
we then go back and check those assumptions and parameters. So we're constantly checking what those assumptions and parameters were to see if um, they crystallize in the future. As you know, in our annual report, we have something called the Community Financial Report, and that's a plain language document that talks to what actually happened, and one could compare it with the budget to what we thought would happen. Um, but what I've said on, on this record before is we are committed at Redland City Council to putting as much as we can into the infrastructure pipeline because it then signals to third parties that this is what we want to deliver. We can then open the doors to get third party funding so we don't have to pull it from the ratepayer. Um, and then the works um, deliver in line with the challenges that not only Council has talked about but everyone's aware. So absolutely we compare our actuals to the budget. Um, I think I've spoken before that in the budget we don't have to comply with the accounting standards so there's things that don't concern us from a budget perspective because a budget is more about raising the cash, ensuring the balance between um, financial sustainability, asset sustainability but also being mindful of um, you know, current times, cost of living pressures etc in the community but then the actuals have other things that the accounting standards require and what I mean particularly is um, provisions, closed landfill provisions, employee provisions and additional disclosures that's not required for a budget so they're not always comparable but we do our best and we certainly look back to better inform our future forecasting and budgeting. Um, uh, any further questions? I'll go back, go back to Councillor Redwoods. Is anything no summing up? I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Next item is 13.2, the Operational Plan Quarterly Performance Report. Councillor McKenzie, you'd like to move the motion. Seconded. Councillor Gole, would you like to speak to it? Councillor McKenzie. Uh, just briefly, um, this is the quarter three report. So for January to April 2023, um, and the Local Government Act requires Council to adopt an operational plan each year um, to set out how it intends to implement the corporate plan based on our the seven themes that we have set in that corporate plan, which is city leadership, strong communities, quantum move the country, natural environment, livable neighbourhoods, thriving economy, efficient and effective organisation. Um, so the plan is structured to reflect those seven themes of the corporate plan and that outlines 30 catalyst project activities and 37 key initiative activities that were planned to be delivered in the 2022-23 financial year. And I encourage all of our residents to have a read of that report so that they can see how council is tracking on all of those initiatives. Any speakers against? There being none, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. 13.3, uh, the Audit and Risk Management Committee meeting minutes. Councillor Hughes is moving that. Councillor McKenzie is seconding that. Over to you, Councillor Hughes. Uh, yes, so I would very briefly thank you, Mayor. The minutes here are, uh, are just so in-depth. You can see each sub subject and each comment underneath. There is an enormous amount of work goes into our audit committees, as I've mentioned before. Just wanted to highlight very quickly the discussion that was had was very, very broad and in-depth with regard to the creation of the Ethics and Integrity Unit within Council. That was an extremely great conversation. Uh, so much goes into that. The Chief Procurement Officer that we're uh, having added to our team we just talked about our underspends and the challenges that we have here in our city managing across the board so much so adding a chief procurement officer what a fantastic achievement for that team uh, the risk management we always talk about risk risk and risk but our cyber risk we've got uh, so much happening in that space led by our team thank you amanda and i think the audit plan, when you have a look at the audit plan, it is a living document. We've actually made some adjustments. We, we might set the, the framework going forward for the next one or two years. This is where we're looking at. But as items uh, may come to, to note or concern, we've got some flexibility there. So the, the rigidity uh, that I actually thought, this is it, this is what we're doing. I like to know what we're doing. We need to be able to be uh, a little bit more nimble and movement. So we're seeing that as well. Thank you. Any speakers against? There being none, I put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously and Councillor Golo has just stepped out. Uh, item 13.4, I'd just like to bring your attention. There's a slight amendment um, in regards to that in attachment two. 
just there was a couple of um, items that were missed out. Um, so if councillors are comfortable with that. Um, so schedule four, so that, that just uh, obviously we're ca we, there's a, a, a raft of issues that are covered under this um, system and so they, these were just overlooked when the report came to you. So there are a couple of changes there. Um, do we need any explanation? But I'll get a move. I'll get a mover and seconder. Thanks. Move, Councillor Hughes. Seconded, Councillor um, Mitchell. So I just get an officer to explain the amended motion. It's just the attachment that's changed. There was. I don't. I think you might find that it's not exactly that. It's. Um, yeah. Would you prefer us to adjourn? Do, would you prefer us to adjourn the meeting so you can get a, a, a update? It's a, there is a yeah, move and adjournment, Councillor Bishop. That's uh, we can if we can move an adjournment if you wish. Probably easier to do that. So we have a move. Can I just see if there's support for that, Councillors? Move the meeting be suspended, adjourned, seconder. Uh, yeah, yeah Councillor McFoglary. So um, we'll move for a five minute adjournment. Thank you. Just wait one second, Councillor Hughes, please. So we just, there's. Are you right? I've put the motion, Councillors, for the adjournment. Those in favour? I thought we have support. Sorry, Councillor. This carried unanimously. Uh, yeah. Move.
So I'm just giving the girls a bit of time to get ready. Uh, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor McKenzie. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. So just um, as we move, before I, I before I ask for speakers, it's, is anyone coming back into the room, by the way? Have they been advised? Um, oh, just checking if they've moved out for a reason if I've asked to move out. Uh, Tony, just so that it, um, just so that everyone understands uh, in the minutes or the, the recording of the meeting that just the administrative error in the report that if you could explain that please. Correct, Madam Mayor. Um, in the attachment, attachment four, that was uh, attached to the original report in uh, Info Council, there was a, an administrative error whereby the existing schedule four um, was included and hadn't been updated to reflect the increase in the penalty units at certain offences in, in, as I say, schedule four. Um, uh, you'll see that uh, that has now been rectified and is on the screen. Um, some penalty some offences now were include uh, were incurring one penalty unit will now incur two penalty units. Um, so the whole intent of the amendment to the local law is to look at the safety of um, pedestrians that uh, utilise, uh, for example, bus zones, taxi zones, and crossings, and in particular school crossings. And in those areas, the uh, penalty units have been uh, significantly increased. Thank you, Tony. Um, now, in light of the fact that we had a, uh, a mover and seconder to allow the officers to explain that, and they probably think, thought they were moving something different, I might just open it up for another mover and seconder so that we can um, be very clear that we know what we're, we're speaking to. So can I have a mover and seconder for the motion? Thank you. Move Councillor Mitchell, seconded Councillor McKenzie. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Mitchell? Yes, please, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll speak to the r report first, and it's important. We're changing some penalty points across the, the city, and, um, and that's for reasons of, of, of safety and amenity. Um, but also, the report is actually about a new regulated area in uh, Dunwich, near one mile around the cemetery. Uh, so that's what this report's about, and certainly think it's a really important piece of the puzzle uh, around Dunwich, and, and be looking for your support of that today. If I speak to the uh, the cemetery matter for a moment. Uh, recently, you may have remembered with the new bus operator uh, uh, turning, uh, coming into Stradbroke, they did a safety review and uh, their research determined that the one mile turnaround uh, was patently unsafe and, and posed an unacceptable risk. That was really unfortunate for the local community, apart from the gain of safety, in that 22 car parks were lost in that turnaround and you can all imagine how that went down uh, when people, when that area is crying out for better transportation. So that was the trigger for, um, uh, and, and the knock-on effect of that was then, of course, people who are in the habit of driving uh, to that area had to look for somewhere else and they started to then, of course, use area within the cemetery that was not ideal should be left for people coming and going to the cemetery. So that's the matter at hand today. Very sensible uh, new portion of regulation and the reasons behind it, so that'll be support. The report, however, does talk to what is the elephant hiding behind the peanut uh, of this report. Uh, on page 128, the report does uh, allude to this engagement on the local law changes will be coordinated with the broader Dunwich engagement. So those of you that um, know Dunwich well, um, we have say you know, 700 residents, 2,000 people across the island, but at Christmas and holiday times which are becoming more across here, say 10,000 people will travel through these areas around Dunwich and so parking and transportation is an absolute premium. And there's been no real strategic approach to this for decades. Now, if we zoom out a little bit further, of course, we're not solving public transport here. We're not solving the port entry with the Dunwich Master Plan or the city plan to fund the new ferry terminals. 
they are the big ticket items which will solve the massive problems. This is council getting on with what it can control, which is good regulation around dunnage. And by dunnage, we mean from one mile uh, and the uh, en entry terminal there, the public um, water-based entry and the bus interchange, uh, right the way back through to Janna Street, Ron Stark Oval, and the foreshore parking there that has uh, become uh, really an eyesore and the, and the foreshore at one mile I'll throw into there but also the commercial area within Dunwich and recently we've had some wonderful um, improvements to that with the new microbrewery and, and uh, wine bar and, and other small businesses so Dunwich is on the up uh, in that way and there's been no real regulation change there for a number of years uh, or nothing significant and of course then we have the residential properties around there so the larger piece that's alluded to on page 128 actually is one of the biggest changes in a township or any area of this city that's been there for the last two or three decades. So the, um, that's, that's the really important uh, piece that's in here. So I look forward to working with the officers and uh, as is the community around Dunwich and across the island uh, to get the initial regulation right, get the right engagement going, so that these very significant changes will be hopefully received positively. Change is tough, but we want to do it right, otherwise it's going to be an absolute nightmare. So while this report speaks um, to, the, to the cemetery portion it, uh, and the, the uh, penalty, uh, the infringement points, uh, which I am absolutely in support of, the stick unfortunately is a part of education. Um, the larger piece that I want to uh, uh, promote to you as councillors and through to the, the media and our community is this should be a really serious engagement process across the island and onto the mainland because those 10,000 visitors that travel through Dunwich come from your areas and across the, the region. So you have an interest in this Dunwich regulation. So thank you and uh, I look forward to working with the officers and getting great uh, engagement piece out into Dunwich and across the city, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mitchell. Um, just to correction, you said city, um, the ferry terminal city plan, it's actually city deal. City deal, And yes. obviously the state's draft um, Gumpy master plan you're referring to as well, the Dunwich Ab master plan. Absolutely, yeah. those very large state-driven proposals sure. that were actually were helped to solve uh, the transportation. Speaker against? Speaker against Councillor Bishop. Um, just bearing in mind, I'm being really conscious here that this is just starting the process. We're not actually doing anything until we speak to the people. So this is commencing the local law, just to be really, really clear. Councillor Bishop is speaking against. Yes, thank you. Um, we had some discussions uh, when we met on Monday and I, uh, in that discussion, I, I, I really believe that the Dunwich piece of consultation, as Councillor Mitchell has referred to, is is the larger piece. It's referred to in page 128, but I actually think that that deserves to be a focus of its own. I understand that this report is seeking to highlight that, but the focus really here is, as it says, the purpose, it introduces a new regulated off-street parking area at the cemetery located at Dunwich and amendments to the penalty units applicable to some minor traffic offences. But as we've gone further into this, to my mind, there are three parts to this, and it feels to me like they're all being um, addressed in this one report. I know they are all linked to the local law, but it feels to me that, that it's a little bit more complicated, and we really should tease these things out. I understand entirely the cemetery needs to be addressed, and I understand that from the, the, the simple um, purpose of this report. When we look at the broader information about Dunwich, I think it is part of the master plan and I think it does deserve a more specific consultation process to take the community on that journey. But then when we add in the third element, which is the penalty units, I'm just concerned that it could create some confusion in the minds of the community. And that's just my perspective and I understand the officers will have their reasons for this. But what I would like to suggest is when we come to the piece, when we're talking about what will become consultation for the changes to the minor, the minor, minor penalty units, which will be occurring on um, uh, 21 days from June 26 to the 17th of July, it's at the inform level. 
I think it's really important that we communicate to the community what the size and scale of those changes are, where they're likely to be, just so that we can take the community on the journey. In summary, to my mind, these are three things that are being put together and I, I find it a little bit um, just confusing and I don't think the message is as clear to the community as we could have made it. That's just my personal view. Thanks. So just uh, one, one point I'd like to make is there is the, the, the master planning of Dunwich is in the hands of the state and they have it's still in draft form and they haven't released it. So we're kind of bound by that at the same time I think it's fair to say that the issues are being exacerbated over there. And so. part of that is the confusion of those other elements and I think where yep. we Go are ahead. looking at the consultation for Dunwich I think it's standalone necessary to, I'll let, to focus on I'll let Tony. Years. I'll let Tony respond. Thank, thank you. Thank you Madam Mayor. Th thank you for the question Councillor Bishop. With regard to local laws there are there we have a local law making process and then part of that process is consultation. So with regard to this Local law number five. There are two two particular amendments with regard to what we're doing. Number one is well, so, so I'll take the easy one first. The easier first is the penalty units, which has to be consulted with the public under our process. The second was the drive. The second driver was the issues around the Dunwich Cemetery. Um, after discussion with um, uh, the direct uh, the general manager of information infrastructure and operations, Dr. Nicole Davis, and the communications team we looked at how best to get this through so with regard to the dunnage component the initial action was for the cemetery because that's causing the most particular concern at the moment but people will only um, respond to certain surveys or questions or consultations and they don't want to be over consulted at times so the decision was to combine the two because was the right thing to do. So when the consultation will go out with regard to Dunwich, it is a consultation on that next level and information that will be sought from not only the smaller component of the, as the Dunwich Cemetery, but the greater component of the Dunwich area as car park, as, as Pete Councillor Mitchell said, parking across the foreshore where we find people leaving their cars for uh, months and months on end, etc., etc., and um, there's been some work done by kayak over there with regard to bollards on the foreshore to um, protect sacred sites, etc., etc. So there are, are there are a number of issues with regard to this, but the bottom line is we're going out for an amendment to a local law to firstly eradicate the problem or fix the problem with the Dunwich Cemetery, but also because the, there is an issue to consult consulting with the, the community over the whole of the Dunwich parking issues. So there are two distinct consultation processes that will be going on. Um, one specific for Dunwich and on the wider um, scale will be the penalty units which will be right across the city as well. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, but it's because of the local law that we've done this issue. Yeah, I appreciate the response. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker 4. If there are no further speakers, I'll hand back to Councillor Mitchell to sum up. Uh, yeah, thank you for the debate, councillors. Um, I, I guess uh, and acknowledge Councillor Bishop's comment that it can be confusing people. Absolutely, it's a massive piece of work. But let's not let um, the pursuit of perfect get in the way of good. Let's get the consultation uh, started, local or underway, and, and big solutions coming. So thank you. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? Those in favour? Councillor Boglari, Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Golay, Councillor Hewlett, Councillor McKenzie, Hughes, Berridge, Williams. Those against? Councillor Edwards, Councillor Tolte and Councillor Bishop. Thank you. Item, next item is 13.5. Do I have a mover and seconder? Thanks. Move Councillor McKenzie. Seconded Councillor Mitchell. Would you like to speak to Councillor McKenzie? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this motion is to adopt a councillor's alcohol and other drugs policy for Redland City Council as attached in attachment one uh, to provide a safe, healthy and productive workplace. Thank you. Any speakers against? Excuse me, Madam Mayor. Um, Sorry, speaker against? I've got a question, please. Sure, your question. I'll just I, I I'll was the council. Sorry, just, just one second. Just making sure there's no speakers against because that's the process. There are none. You have a question? Yes, my question is I was the councillor who brought this motion originally mm -hmm. um, and my hand went up very quick so I'd like to know why you did not pick me to bring this motion please. 
Councillor. I have. I'm sorry. I have. Uh, don't have. 360 views of the room, so I just saw Councillor Mitchell's hand scarf and there's it's nothing. It's very quicker. odd, thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, if there's no further questions, no speakers against, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? Those in favour? Councillor Boglari, Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Golay, Councillor Hewlett, Councillor Edwards, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Berridge, Councillor Bishop, Councillor Williams, those against? Councillor Tolte, thank you. Uh, moving on to item. 15, sorry, 15.1, move Councillor Edwards, seconded Councillor McKenzie. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Edwards? Uh, just just quickly, uh, this is the uh, Land Island Recreation Club, uh, it's on the council of property. It's been had, um, operating from uh, since 1986, I believe. It's the only uh, club of its type for serving Land Island residents with uh, social activities. Proposed for a new five year lease. You'll notice from the map that the lease boundaries change slightly. That better reflects the activities with clubs, clubs used. Um, I just recommend the, the continuance of the lease for the, that community. Thank you. Any speakers against? There being none, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 15.2 is the Kitchen Mudlow Recreation Club. Um, Move Councillor Hewlett, seconded Councillor Golay. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Hewlett? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the Future Mudlow Recreation Club is a, a really a important hub on the Isle of Future Mudlow. I'm glad to see this list go through. It has like tennis, cricket, crochet, it has a theatre club, it has a choir club, it has an annual art show, um, it has umpteen different types of um, games, meetings in the, in the community centre itself through the week. Um, outside that, also the Coast Care about to have a hub built within the recreational area and although SES is on a different lease it's within that facility as well so it's a really important facility for the community, community so I fully support the officer's recommendation thank you just questioning is it crochet or croquet <laughs> <laughs> thank you but okay. you knitted it together very well thank you no one's no one's excluded whether you're a knitter or a crochet or a croquet player um, I uh, any speakers against I'll put the motion in which case, those in favour, those against, that's carried unanimously, thank you. Item 15.3 uh, is options to protect koala habitat trees in Thornlands Koala. A mover and seconder, thanks. Move Councillor Golo, seconder Councillor Boglari. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Golo? Uh, yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I'm in support of the officer's recommendation um, and I've brought this motion previously, primarily because it incorporates a koala safe neighbourhood that's made up of um, large parkland area, so there's not going to be any type of um, development in that council parkland area. The, the remainder of Fitzroy Street in particular is already uh, a built suburb, it's already built out. Um, the challenge that we have now is that that particular area, and it's only a small area, um, there's a number of things happening at the moment. So first of all, we, we do have um, injuries to wildlife through speeding motorists, and both Councillor Mitchell and I are working on that now as uh, finding solutions to that. Um, there's an actual known breeding area. So there's actually koalas in that particular area. They're actually there. It's not evidence, it's not scratchings, it's actual animals in trees. Um, we need to protect and bring that small parcel into what is already a mapped corridor. So whether we call it a stepping stone or whatever, it should have been brought into um, the mapping anyway. So I'm actually in support of having it brought into that state mapping um, as part of the existing corridor. Um, and that way we'll alleviate any type of confusion about any types of larger gum trees that are actually habitat trees with animals in them um, and we'll, we'll offer some further protection to that species in that area. Thank you. Any speakers against? Councillor Tolte? I'd actually like to move an amendment if I could, Madam Mayor. I would You'll need to explain that amendment, Councillor. Yeah, it's a very simple amendment. Um, happy with the um, intent 
but I am uncomfortable with the description of the area as the Thornlands Koala Safe Neighbourhood. I would prefer that rather than those words, the actual um, street names or a description of the area of intent be in there rather than Thornlands Koala Safe Neighbourhood. The, those words, um, we have Koala Safe but Neighbourhoods. Councillor, you can't talk to your amendment until I actually see it. Okay. So I'm just going to ask. I don't. Have you got? Have you got anything there for that? Can I? Can I just raise a point of order? Though? Uh, well, it needs to be a point of order, not not to be debate. It's all. It, the point of order is, is that it actually is called the Thornlands Quail Safe Neighbourhood. Yeah, I understand that. There's but there's actually council investment into that area to to make it that way. So can I? Yeah. Well, that's fine. That's not a point of order. I just need. Councillor Tolte, I was unaware of your amendment and I don't know what the boundaries of this particular area is, so um, you, you'll probably need, if, if you want to, we can let it lie on the table until you get that information. Um, well, I can't, I can't actually move her amendment. I can't even put that as a motion until I know what it reads. That's my issue. So I'm not going to request another adjournment so that everyone can go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> so, um, Dean, is there, or David, is there any... Fitzroy Street. Okay. Can we just call it... Um, uh, it is Fitzroy Street. That is the Koala Safe neighbourhood. Right. Well, can we just call it Fitzroy Street, please? Well, so that your, your motion reads to advocate for improved koala, koala, koala habitat ma mapping in the Redlands Coast, including that area, uh, including Fitzroy Street, be regulated just as locally. advocate for improved koala habitat mapping in Fitzroy Street, Redlands Coast. Thornlands, whatever. Is it Cleveland? Or all? Well, whatever. And then we don't need the rest. So, that, so that's the amendment. Right, so it doesn't change the intent. So that it's been, that's an amendment it's being moved. It's just geographically accurate. That's um, Councillor Tolte moving that amendment. Do we have a seconder to that amendment? Councillor Edwards is seconding that. Um, so, Councillor Tolte, would you like to speak to your amendment? And then I'll take a vote on the amendment before the motion. Well, we have a significant level of protection across the city. We have multiple overlays, including state and local overlays, habitat overlays, fire protection overlays, etc., in relation to vegetation across the city. If we're going to refer this back up to the state to look at, I would very much like it for the state uh, officers that are looking at it to be very directly referred to the area that we're talking about. That is this area that is of concern in Fitzroy Street, Cleveland. It concerns me we have koala safe neighbourhoods all over the city and I do not want to broaden the level of interest across those. There's no problem with those. The problem is specific to Fitzroy Street and so therefore the intent is Fitzroy, Fitzroy Street and I believe this more accurately defines what is being um, looked at. Yeah, so I would prefer that it be very pinpoint accurate and speak to the actual problem trying to be addressed. Speaker against the amendment? Is there a, a question? Yeah, through myself to... Yep, through you to... Can we have an officer please to explain what difference this makes because my understanding that area is known as the Thornlands Koala Safe Neighbourhood and it was more than just Fitzroy Street which we were cons looking there, at. So there's also Cleary Street. Thank please. you. One person at a time. The officer has been asked to, resp to, to respond. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So through you to councillors. So the Koala Safe, Thornlands Koala Safe Precinct is an adopted precinct. Uh, it is broader than Fitzroy Street, so it actually on the northern extent is Long Street. Uh, the western extent is Bloomfield Street, and then we go out to uh, to the bay to the to the east and the south. So it's much broader than Fitzroy Street. We may be able to bring up the mapping if that would assist councillors on the screen. Ha um, happy to happy to include you know bounded by Long Street and what was the other one? Bloomfield Street. And Bloomfield Street. Suggestion we have Thornlands. Bounded by the Thornlands 
safe, koala safe neighborhood map because then that includes those boundaries for you. Same thing. Councillors, through the chair, and we're not on an adjournment here. We're not. We're just getting the information that's required. So I, I just had a question asked. It was answered. Um, do we have a speaker against? Can we bring up the map? So Sarah, if we could search for the Thornlands Koala Safe Precinct, that should come up. Thank you. You ha we, while that's happening, we have a speaker against Councillor Bishop. Uh, yes, thank you. Speaking against the, the amendment. Speaking against the amendment. Uh, we've had workshops, um, officers uh, responding to uh, a notice of motion from the divisional councillor. This language, Thornlands Koala Safe Neighbourhood, is established within council, in other areas, within the community, um, I think to try to adjust at this last late stage for something which seems to satisfy what might be in the mind of the councillor and those who wish to support is not as clear as what we are taking as a policy position on what koala safe neighbourhoods are and specifically this Thornlands koala safe neighbourhood. I, I think it, it is uh, a little, too little, too late and I think the work really that the officers have done in support of what Councillor Golo has asked for on behalf of his community and on behalf of the vegetation and the flora and fauna in that area is addressed by this. I don't think supporting uh, the change to this um, uh, motion is, is defensible at this point. I just don't. While we're waiting for the maps, another speaker for? You want to ask a question, Councillor McKenzie? Sorry, yes, I, I did honestly think that it was specifically more just Fitzroy Street yeah, that, that was we, the motion um, that Councillor Golay was bringing and that's what he had spoken to. I just want to understand how much of that area is already mapped as state koala mapping because are we t asking them to go review the whole area that may already be mapped as koala state mapping or is it just, because <coughs> my understanding is that there's already it's just the bit that was koalas, missing. Koala safe mapping in there. Plus, there's a wildlife, there's the wildlife connection plan coming through there as well. Incorporates all that. So we probably have to bring up Queensland Globe to get the koala mapping up, which can be time-consuming. We might get that. So, councillors, that's the map. Um, And I guess what the, what Councillor McKenzie has just asked for is the existing mapping over that area. So through you, Madam Mayor, so Dean will just work to get that uh, MSES mapping on the screen so councillors can see. Per the report, that it's got 373 prop. That doesn't necessarily have but state mapping over it. That's wasn't what your I think motion a concern for the area of Fitzroy Street that was not already included in other mapping? Councillors, through the chair, thank you. Now, councillors. Councillors, I understand. I think w the question. W Councillor Golay, please, time. Councillors, this is not a time for chit chat. We're just getting the map up. We're in standing orders at the moment, and questions and, and um, speaking for and against goes through the chair. And until I get that map up, as has been requested, I just ask you to be patient. Can you just use your mouse to... You're right, yeah.
Sorry guys, so I'm just going to use my mouse because the when I zoom it doesn't go to the appropriate scale. Um, it sort of goes too far, but we're generally talking about this area here where my mouse is hovering now. Show us Fitzroy Street too, please, just from, from a distance. Do you want to zoom in on no, just you show me just with your mouse because I'm just sorry, I'm just it's my eyes. So this is can you see is, is my mouse appearing we're, we're, so Fitzroy Street We're talking about a small so like area. Council of Golay I'm already Councillor Golay. It's Gole. already a Thornland's Quila safe neighbourhood. Understand. All that area. I'm not Counsel asking for that. Councillor Golay. So I just uh, the question was asked about the map. So the area is. There's a lot, no, there's enough. a there's enough. a right. Councillor Golay. Councillor, please do not talk over. Look at it. Councillor Golay, please do not talk Feel over the chair. To call the OIA and kick um, me out. I'm Council sick there. of this. I am sick of the agendas here. I'm going to call. I'm going to call a, a, an adjournment in a minute, so that you can all get your act together and actually live by the standing orders that you've all adopted. Thank you. So that that has the officers have shown you that there's an amendment live on the floor. There's another question that um, has been asked of me through to you, Councillor Golly. Councillor Mitchell, would you like to ask that question? Yes, thank you. Through you, to Councillor Golly. Uh, from all our, our discussions within workshops and and as a cohort, my understanding was that. The concern was along Fitzroy Street, and Fitzroy Street, by the way, is extremely long, comes right the way from Bloomfield Street and down. So it was really the area of concern that I understood before um, the, the neighbourhood uh, definition came through was between Long and Beach streets, and there were some individual large mature trees that you were concerned with, and I and I respect that that concern what's before us now is much beyond that so the question is was that the original uh, concern intent was between Long and Beach Street along some of the mature trees along Fitzroy Street between Long and Beach Street. Answer Councillor Glyde through the chair. So if you look at if you look at Fit Street <sighs> so if you see if you see the extent of Henry Ziegenfuse Park, the big open space there, down Fitzroy Street, down to, what's that? Is that South Street, where the corridors already exist? Yep, so in that... <coughs> yeah, I can't see anything. So South Street sits in the centre of the area um, and if I can direct you to page 175 of the report, we're talking about 373 properties in the area that contain koala habitat including single trees. So that's, that's what we're talking about more specifically. Not I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I just don't know how this has been made so convoluted. We are talking about the area consisting of Henry Ziegenfuse Park, down to Beach Street, which is basically 400 metres long, and it consists of Henry Ziegenfuse Park, where they do all their park runs, and the existing acreage properties that incorporate Cleary Street. We've already got coastal mapped corridor, and all I was asking for was to have that particular area included into the mapping, because it is a known breeding area. I don't know how this has been blown out to 300 odd properties and oh my god the sky's falling. That is already the Thornlands koala safe neighbourhood. It's already been approved, done, dusted. I'm not talking about that. How did we get this so convoluted? But it sits with Councillors through, through the chair please. It don't sits within that koala safe neighbourhood. And it's the mapping, the mapping may be different. The mapping, the state's mapping is different to what is the koala um, safe neighbourhood. That's, I think that's the point of contention. I think David's nodding at me. So I, I understand what you're saying. I understand what Councillor Tolte's saying. So I just want David maybe to give you a response to that. So whether we find a way or whether we want this to lie on the table and, and have some more discussion about it. Well, no. I'm not asking you alone, Councillor. Thank you. No, well, I'm not. Thank you, Councillor. Hand down. I've got it, David it, ready it to... It can't be this hard. 
It just Councillor, Councillor, I've got David ready to respond. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, so through you, so the Koala Safe neighbourhood is a non-statutory uh, construct, if you like. That's council policy uh, that's been adopted. Separate to that, we have state mapping for uh, matters of uh, state environmental significance, which includes koala habitat. The question that's been uh, asked of officers back in, uh, I think it was March, you resolved, uh, council, that you would like us to investigate options to uh, consider greater statutory protection for the Thornlands koala safe neighbourhood in its entirety. Now there was reference to Fitzroy Street in particular, but the resolution was to consider the neighbourhood uh, in its entirety. So that was the resolution of the council. So that's what officers have done and brought back to you for your consideration. Uh, and just a, just a, um, another point, I guess, is there is no urgency on this. So you know, if you did want to defer for more time, then certainly you could do that if you wish. That's the council. And I think the other point is we're just advocating. We're not actually. So we're advocating to have the state consider it. Um, that, that's my understanding. Um, okay, we've gone backward and forward. You have a question, Councillor Tolte? Or I'm, or I, or I'm come back to you. No, you've already spoken against it, Councillor. Well, can I raise no, a point Council of order? No. Yes, I have a question, Madam Mayor. What is your question, Councillor Tolte? If I can, through you to Councillor Golay, as this is in response to his motion. My understanding was that the mention of the Koala Safe neighbourhood was in evidence to support the need to expand the protected area on those particular trees in Fitzroy Street. It was, and I'm, I'm asking Councillor Golay, and from what he said, I think I have not misconstrued it. It was not his intent to have this put over the entire koala safe neighbourhood area. It was his intent to get increased protections in Fitzroy Street on those particular areas of, of small acreage properties that were not mapped and his his use of the wording of koala safe neighbourhood was in his argument in support of your that expanded your area. question councillor is that correct because it wasn't uh, was your intent the entire 300 and whatever properties or was your intent in bringing the motion just those properties that you previously mentioned through the chair, can you respond please, Councillor Through, through the chair, my intent was recognising that it was already a koala safe neighbourhood, but from Fitzroy Street, Henry Ziegenfuse Park, Cleary Street, down to the coast coastal area, because there was definite animals in the tree and it's a breeding site, I wanted that included in the mapping. My understanding is it's not included in any state or local mapping for protection. We're not talking 300 odd properties here. We're talking about a known site that has animals sitting there. So, so I think, I, I think in order to get this right, if council, if council is comfortable, because what I'm hearing that. Uh, I believe we're in agreement. It's uh, just thank, thank you, you councillor. Councillor, what's your point of order? Uh, well, I believe that we, not just one councillor, but we're failing to comply with proper procedures. I'm not sure if we're in formal debate or if we're in just general chat. chat. I just want to understand where we're at. Councillors. It's a very simple, a motion has been thank you, put to you the order. We were debating it. I'm rule, I'll rule on your point of order. You've actually raised it. And, and at this point Thanks. in time, the chair is able to ask if councillors have questions to resolve the, the uh, points where we can't agree, and that's exactly where we're at, so I don't think it's a point of order, thank you. Um, councillors, I'm hearing there's some agreement, but I'm not quite sure if that's going to satisfy everyone in the room, and I would suggest that maybe we need to let this lie on the table so that we can have... Uh, thank you, councillor. I'd like to come back to the point of order, because I believe that, that's there a ruling is, from the chair. It's I'm not a ruling from the chair, councillor. I'm asking councillors if they feel there's worthy, worthy, well, further worthy well, discussion. Well, now we're debating something different. We're about debating the amendment, thank you, Councillor. And if you'd like to chair the meeting, there's a, an election in March next year that you can actually have the opportunity to do that. And good luck. I was just trying to raise a simple point of order so we and are I rule, aware And I ruled on that, and, and you are actually controversial. You are now raising a point of order, Councillor, because you're talking over the chair. Thank you. So, Councillors, I'll seek your indulgence. I'm happy to put the motion, the amendment, um, but if you want to get it right, there's opportunity to have further discussion. Or we can adjourn the meeting now and we can have that discussion right now and um, come back to it later. Can I just seek it if there's uh, any love in the room for that? Thank you. Councillor Tolte. 
I'm happy to move a five minute adjournment. I think we can sort it out and do it today. Councillors, are you? Is there a seconder for that? Councillor Mitchell, would you? I'll put the motion those for an adjournment for five minutes to sort it out. Those in favour? Those against? Those in favour? Councillor Boglari, Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Tolte, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Bishop, Councillor Williams. Those against? Councillor Golay, Councillor Hewlett, and Councillor Berridge. So we'll take the five. And this is not a um, bathroom break or
So I just need a motion to come back into session. Councillor McKenzie has moved that. Um, Councillor Edwards has seconded that. Those in favour? Coming back into session. Those against? That's carried unanimously. I bring forward the, the motion that Councillor Tolte, you, I think there's some changes to that. So as the mover of the amendment, I need you to make sure that you're comfortable with that. And the yes, seconder okay. was Councillor Edwards. Are you comfortable with that, Councillor Edwards? Um, do you require to speak to it any further or can we just test the amendment? No, the I floor? don't require to speak to it. Thank you. Okay, well, can I put the motion that we um, accept the amendment? Those in favour? Those against? Those in favour, Councillor Boglari, Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Golay, Councillor Hewlett, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Tolte, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Bishop, Councillor Williams. Those against, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Berridge. We now have the substantive motion in front of us. Do we require any further um, discussion, councillors? If, if I can have a, if, if I can then put that motion to you. Those in favour? Those against? Those in favour are Councillor Boglari, Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Golay, Councillor Hewlett, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Tolte, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Berridge, Councillor Bishop, Councillor Williams. Those against, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. All right. Um, so the next item, councillors, is item 15.4. If I could have a move, a move, Councillor Berridge, seconded Councillor Boglari. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Berridge? Oh, I Yes, I'm happy to speak to it, but Councillor Buglaria had her hand up before I did. Councillor, um, I, you moved the motion, so therefore you are the person who has the opportunity to speak to it. So, um, hmm. forgot my notes. Sorry through all that. To defer to Councillor Boglari, Councillor, to speak to it and uh, give up. Give yes, up your I would. I would actually. So you give up your op opportunity to speak to yes, it. I'll allow Councillor Boglari to speak to it. I would put it straight to Councillor Boglari. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, to have an understanding of why there is a need for Council to make a submission on this PIR, we have to acknowledge the koala is an endangered species, and the Queensland government and local councils need to act strongly to protect the koala that is under significant pressure from habitat loss, climate change, attack from wild and domestic dogs, vehicle strikes and diseases. Increasing and reviewing protection of the southeast Queensland Kohala habitat is in direct response to widespread community concern, not just in Redlands, but across southeast Queensland and I would dare to go as far as say internationally. This agenda item is to consider the content of, Queen's, of Council's submission in regards to the state's consultation on a post-implementation review improving SEQ's koala habitat regulations. The current state koala mapping and legislative framework is an outcome of the 2016 UQ study on Southeast Queensland koala population modelling and a lot of research from a lot of different agencies went into this study. The study, not surprisingly, identified a decline in the koala population of around 80% of the koala population in the identified koala coast area, which includes our lovely Redlands. And this was from a period of 1969 to 2014, despite various protections being in place. After consultation with those experts and researchers in the field, in February 2020, DES, or the Department of Environmental and Science, notified Council of their proposed amendments relating to future koala habitat protection and the planning framework with the intent to increase protection on the remaining SEQ koala habitat. Council at the time considered and responded to this report in May 2020 and voiced concerns as just under 6,155 hectares of koala habitat land that previously had some degree of protection was not protected under this new um, framework. In the final 2020 map, due to Council's concerns, this amount of land was reduced to 2,500 being removed. Now Council has again an opportunity to inform final recommendations for the continued relevance and effectiveness of those 2020 changes. I think it is very responsible and I believe for accountability that DES is reviewing the development regulations and protections that were implemented um, to ensure continuing protection of remaining habitat. 
The koala is a recognised species with high cultural and, as we all know, emotional significance. And it is due to this status the koala is a national icon, known throughout the world as a symbol of Australia. And here in Redlands, in the Koala Coast, we are so fortunate to have koalas remaining in our bushland. Having this bushland is not only providing habitat for the wildlife, including the koala, but promotes tourism and is a fantastic attractor, bringing the external dollar to our local economy. This review has been written to include feedback from all stakeholders, including the industry, de developers, local governments and various community groups and is written to address their concerns going forward. Concerns from local governments were in relation to exemptions for development, such as allowing significant habitat clearing without offset requirements, as the PIR showed extensive habitat clearing was still occurring. And further information relating to the stacking of exemptions, etc., for extra clarity can be found on page 24 of the PIR. It also outlines the limitations of mapping and Council's role to regulate the mapped areas, costs to administer and also costs to applicants is also noted and unnecessary time, lay, time delays and costs for all the stakeholders. The option the Council officers are recommending addresses these concerns which were gathered in that feedback and the recommendation includes improving clarity for landowners and developers increasing guidance and clearer information on thresholds for small-scale infrastructure and improving effectiveness of the intent to protect koala habitat. This also means for Redlands, where the community and council pride ourselves on protecting and enhancing our environment, Redlands Coast being naturally wonderful, that those areas not, not previously included and in other valuable koala habitat areas required for breeding and feeding and the sustainability of our Redlands koala population will have improved protection. Stim similar to the state government, council should be committed to ensuring the legislation is necessary and effective, providing clear benefits for the region in regards to koala habitat protection. And it's for those reasons I have mentioned I support and I encourage councillors today to also support the officer's recommendation to make a submission as provided in attachment one. Almost exactly, five minutes, almost. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit over. Um, so that was the speaker for, any speakers against? Okay, well then in which case I put the motion, those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously, thank you councillors. Uh, there's no um, notice of intention to repeal or amend. We do have a notice of motion, Councillor McKenzie. Would you like to move your motion, Councillor McKenzie? Can I have a second to thank? Seconded, Councillor Bishop. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor McKenzie? Um, just that this motion um, resolves to extend the public consultation period for the draft planning scheme amendment 01 slash 21 major amendment environmental significance overlay that is currently out of public consultation. Um, for a period of 15 working days to end on the 14th of July 2023. Um, just, it's all in the background there that we're, we're asking just to extend that consultation period so that we ensure that all residents under that this proposed amendment will impact have been notified, also understand what is being proposed and can make an informed decision. There is a bit of feedback um, that some residents are a bit confused and don't understand what the implications could possibly be, so this just allows them some extra time to understand that and to make a submission. The speaker against? If I may um, ask Councillor McKenzie, would she consider making amendment to make it to the end of July because that's what the officers have told our residents. The, uh, the of longer, a longer consultation. Yeah, a longer I'm, consultation I'm period. I'm yeah, officers. Open to longer consultation. Yeah. I did not know that officers had told that. So yeah. yes, happy to expand. Yeah, it officers have been talking with residents who have to get their head around the fact that the state mapping is also on their land, yep. and they've been told um, to the end of July. So just to make the two, if you wouldn't yep. mind just um, so changing the date. We can just take out then for a period of 15 working days, and just to have it to end on 31st of July. Is that correct? Are you happy with that, David? Yeah, that's fine, Madam Mayor. Just to confirm, so we've been advising uh, the community and residents that they can make late submissions until the end of July. Um, if you resolve to extend that period, then that's in alignment with 
I think it saves some confusion, frankly. Um, I just know my officers, and then Councillor Berridge came back from talking to officers yesterday and said to me that her office, her staff, oh, her staff, her residents have also said that. So okay, just so to make it all gel. If you're happy for that to, that amendment to occur yeah. without having to go through a formal process, no, I just need to take out the, for a period of 15 Make it to the 31st as well of July. Okay. You have a question? Oh. Well, just as the seconder, I'm happy to. Um, support that. Support that, and also just note that the officers have been very understanding sure. about the feedback that's been thank coming you. back and have been working with residents along the way. So thank them. No speakers against. Um, Councillor. Speaker against. Comment, Madam Mayor. Well, I'm not taking comments. You can ask a question if you wish, but um, not comments. Oh, if I'll, that's I'll ask a question then. <laughs> a question. Uh, given that we've got a longer uh, consultation period now. Could, could we ask that the officers conducting the um, consultation take a look at the information provided both online and via the letters from the perspective of not an internal person but a, 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 a lay person going Plain through English. our public website and, and simplify the information and the mapping that is there. It is so confusing. If you, look, if you go to the website, the external website, and you try to find this information, and then you try to decipher it, it is really difficult. Okay. And you, it's Councilor no Talty, surprise that people are confused. So can that be looked at from that perspective and fixed on, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So through you to Councillor Talty, yes, we could have a look at that. But what I would say is it is uh, a very complex area when it comes to vegetation management I don't think now there's any more complex area when it comes to, to planning regulations but certainly we can have a look and see what we can do. There's your answer. Um, with that um, is it, if there's no further discussion Councillor McKenzie don't need to sum up I'll put the motion those in favour those against that's carried unanimously. Uh, there, I haven't been advised of any urgent business um, but there are some confidential items I'm just going to I'm going to ask you if you would like to go into confidential session or are you happy to just move the motions as required? No, one's, no one wants to move into confidential, so in which case I'll go straight to the motions, councillors. Yep. You all good? Yeah, um, so the first item is uh, 20.1, use of state emergency services, separate charge um, and authority to excuse me, contract the construction of an open warehouse structure at the SES Cleveland Depot. Uh, move Councillor Mitchell, second and Councillor Boglari, those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Uh, amendment to register of fee and fees and charges, mover and seconder for that, thank you. Move Councillor Boglari, seconded Councillor Edwards, um, those in favour? Those against? Those in favour? Councillor Boglari, Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Golay, Councillor Hewlett, Councillor Edwards, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Berridge, Councillor Bishop, Councillor Williams. Those against? Councillor Tolte. Uh, 20.3 Voluntary Transfer of Land Concession moved by Councillor uh, Edwards, seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Um, those in favour? Those against? Those in favour? Those against, that's carried unanimously. Item uh, 20.4, Digital Transformation Program, mover and seconder, thanks. Move Councillor McKenzie, seconded Councillor Hughes. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried unanimously. Item 20.5, disposable, disposable, disposal of land uh, by grant of a lease. Move Councillor um, Boglari, sorry, seconded Councillor Tolte. Those in favour? Those against? Those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. With that, um, if I can just remind you, make sure you've signed off on your diligent boards. I'd like to thank the officers um, and the patience of everyone around the room to come up with some compromise and um, we'll close the meeting at 12.31. Thank you.